Okay, if you guys watch the announcements, you know that we're going over who am I? I'm, who am I? I'm Pastor Lee, duh. All right, stop asking me that question. Um, no, we're, we're going through who am I, so we're looking into scripture and we're talking about uh, things uh, pertaining to that. And tonight, we fall on a night where we're going to talk about uh, homosexuality because even in middle school, even in elementary school, you're, you're seeing this type of thing and you're being confronted with the question of uh, homosexuality and uh, a lot of people have a lot of different views. The culture has a view of homosexuality, uh, the way that uh, they view it. Uh, so tonight, what I want to do is I want to talk to you guys and, and share with you guys. Uh, first, I want to say this. Um, you know, I was watching a lot of teachings and I was seeing how different pastors kind of handled it, uh, the subject and, and how they went about it. And I like what one guy said, and I think that uh, it, it kind of falls kind of in the same lines of, of what I'm thinking is, typically we don't, we don't just like highlight one particular sin, like that's not our practice. We, we, we don't like to, to kind of do that because it makes one sin look worse than all the other sins that there are. So typically we don't do that because that's not, that's not who we are. We see, you know, we don't just dog on, on one person. We don't just highlight it and, and make one sin look like it's like the cardinal sin. The cardinal sin is the sin that you can't be forgiven of, you know. So that's not typically what we do. But the reason why we're going to talk about this tonight is because of two things. Uh, here's a quote uh, from a, a well-known pastor. It says this, one of the most uh, volatile and important issues facing the church today, you guys are the church, as Christians, one of the most important things facing us today is the question of homosexuality as an alternative lifestyle. The church, listen to this, the church cannot duck this question. We cannot hide from this question. We cannot duck it. We shouldn't duck it. We should be able to address it. And if there's anybody that I think that should be able to address it, it's you guys. You're young. You're seeing it. It's a whole lot different than it was whenever I was young. Sure, it was, it was, it was pretty bad whenever I was young. But it, it just continues to, to, go, to go further. Um, and so you guys are confronted with a lot of different things. Uh, here's, a, here's a statement as well. It says this, predictably, listen, this is, pre this is predicted, younger people often perceive Christianity negatively. So when people hear that you're a Christian, they automatically get this thought in their head of what Christianity is and who you are because you just said you were Christian. They have negative thoughts toward Christianity. The Barna Group found that young people think that Christians, the Barna Group, it's a research, uh, Christian research uh, company, and they just, they, they, they have statistics, and this is one of them. They found that young people think that Christians are not only opposed to homosexuality, but also show excessive contempt and unloving attitudes toward gays and lesbians. 91% of young non-Christians and 80% of young churchgoers perceive Christianity as anti-homosexual. Did you get that? So whenever you say, I'm a Christian, no matter who you're talking to, the one thing that they think, nine out of 10 or even eight out of 10, that's still a lot, think, okay, I know what they believe about this issue. And I know, so they have this perception of what you are, of who you are, what you think of the subject. And so today, I thought it would be appropriate if we just give you guys a game plan. And I, and I fill you guys in on a couple things. You have papers where you can take notes. This is gonna be an important one to take notes because this is in your face. And a lot of you guys need to hear some of these things. It's going to address several. Um, and listen, tonight, I'm not gay bashing. I'm, I'm not, um, that's, that's not my heart, that's not my intent. Uh, my intent is love and to be honest and clear with you guys and clear with everybody and see what God has to say and show and do this in a loving and compassionate way, okay? So let me pray. God, thank you so much 
again for tonight, for the 180 band, for 180 and as a whole, and for what you're going to teach us tonight. God, we're so excited to look into your word and to just discuss these things. And in small groups, to discuss it with one another, to, to bring up questions and issues and things that we're wrestling with. No doubt, God, that each of us in here, I mean, probably know someone who is struggling with this question of homosexuality. Um, and, and, they're, and, and, and they have these feelings or, or these things are going out. Or maybe, God, there's someone in here today who struggled with this question in their own life. I pray that you would give us wisdom and grace and that we would do this in love and that we would show people your heart, that you are a loving God, compassionate, that you are continuing to, continuing to tell us to turn from our selfishness and turn to you in the way that, that you want us to go. So bless this time, bless 180, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. <clears throat> okay, so get this. As Christians, this is the first point that I'm going to make. You can write this one down. It'll be up on the board. Here it goes. Don't be scared to speak up. That's the first thing I'm going to say to you guys. As Christians, don't be scared to speak up. Christians who reject the legitimacy of homosexual lifestyle are routinely denounced. So we are often denounced as homophobic, as intolerant, and even hateful. Do you get that? Whenever we begin to tell what God says or what the scriptures say, when people begin to hear us speak, we usually hear name calling start to happen where we get called, man, you're being hateful. Man, I can't believe that. Or you're being intolerant. Man, you're not tolerating people. You're being, man, you're a homophobe. Listen, this, this message is going to cut some of you guys deep maybe because I'm gonna address some other things. Um, in the game room earlier, I even heard somebody say, you ready? Man, this is gay. I was like, oh, that's convenient for tonight. I'll tell you guys a little bit about that in a second. Many homosexuals testify, listen to this. Um, there is a tremendous amount of intimidation concerning this for us. I know for me, Personally, whenever I start to hear people talk about this subject, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I get a little intimidated because I know what I just told you guys, that 80%, 90% of people who hear that I'm a Christian are knowing what I'm going to say and have probably been talked to about this issue and have probably come off... Uh, as, as, as a bigot, as someone who's hateful, as someone who's prideful, who isn't thinking about this person as a person, but who's, who's thinking about how to win an argument or how they can uphold the word of God. That's not a bad thing. Okay, upholding the word of God and, and, and following what the Bible says is a great thing. But the way that you do that among unbelievers as well as believers is very important. So the first thing I'm going to tell you guys is don't be scared to speak up. Even though someone may call you homophobic, please study this yourself. Know what you're talking about. And listen, when someone calls you intolerant, I've talked to you guys about this before. The, the, the issue is, look, let me just draw a picture of what intolerance looks like. The Crusades... Christianity in, in the Middle Ages, when the, the Crusades were happening, that was intolerance. They were saying, come to our faith or we're going to kill you. Okay, we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're saying, this is what I believe. And often a great way to start a conversation with somebody is like this. Hey, I'm a Christian and I'm going to ask you really quickly, can you not judge me for what I'm about to say? Like, this is what I believe and I don't, I don't hate you. I don't think you're any less of a person than I am. I think uh, you're awesome that you're created in God's image. But this is what the Bible says. Can you, can, can you just not judge me on, on what I'm about to say? Like, that's a great way. It throws them off, and then it puts them kind of in the hot seat when you're, when you're in a conversation. Okay, intolerance is not just having a disagreement. In fact, in order for intolerance to 
you know, to happen, or for tolerance to happen, there has to be a disagreement. I have to have, I have to say A is true, and this person has to say B is true. And then what happens is, is A true or B true? And then all of a sudden people start fighting, and they start pointing fingers, calling names. That's intolerance. But if I'm just telling you what I believe, that's not intolerance. I can still be in the same room as you. I can still love you. I can still be your friend and talk to you. How many of you guys have friends right here that you disagree with, that you have fights with? All right, just because you have an argument or, or a disagreement doesn't mean that it has to elevate into, man, whatever, man, you're this and you're that. Look, this subject is a little touchy because you know it deals with certain things, but that doesn't mean that you can't be somebody's friend. And I hope that that's something that you guys get out of this. Number one, don't be scared to speak up. Here it goes, number two, this is the second thing you guys can write down. Facts are not enough. Facts aren't enough. Facts are not enough. This issue that we're talking about right here, homosexuality, is about actual people. They're about your friends. They're about your family. Some of you guys, they're about your peers. They're about people that we care about. And insensitivity, like saying, oh man, this is, this is gay, or if I hear you guys say a, a gay joke or uh, a homophobic joke, or if I hear you guys after this talking about um, how you, you know somebody who's gay and they're dumb, or, or you're making fun, or you're making jokes and cracking jokes about homosexuality, listen, I'm not gonna tolerate it. If I hear that, I'm gonna cut it down. I'm gonna call you out, okay? Here, that is not what we do. We are loving, and we show people the gospel. Everybody struggles with things. Listen to this. Many homosexuals testify how agonizing it is to find yourself with these desires. I've heard it. I've heard it on the radio. I've heard it from other people that whenever you are struggling with this homosexual tendency, guess what? It's not something that, that they enjoy so much. They struggle with the desires and they fight against them. And they'll tell you that they would never choose to be that way. Statistics and Bible verses are not enough. So just because you're equipped with Bible verses that say things about homosexuality, just because you have statistics about homosexuality is not enough. It's not enough. Because what that's gonna come across as is, like I said, intolerant and even hateful. You guys have to be smart in this. If you're armed with Bible verses and you're using them as bullets to hurt somebody, that's incorrect. Usually that ends with, with them and, and you have like these, these catchphrases, these, these cliche phrases that you use like, man, God made, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Come on, man. Like, what, what, is that, what does that even mean? Yeah, okay, that's true. God made Adam and Eve, yes. But, like, explain, please, talk to me. Can, can you please talk to me like a human being? Okay? If you say something like, man, God, like, this is some, this is, you gotta remember, like, this is stuff that they, that people hear often. And oftentimes when you say something like, man, God hates the sin but, but loves the sinner, like, that's a, th I think that's a good saying. I thought about it and I'm like, you know, that's, that's true. God doesn't like our sin and he loves us and he loves us so much that he sent his son. But why do we have to say that catchphrase to, to people who aren't of the faith? The only thing that they're hearing when, they, when you say that to them is, I'm a sinner. God hates me. Even though what you're trying to say is the exact opposite, that's what they're hearing. They don't care about your, your catchphrases as much as, I think 1 Peter 3.14 says this, that we're supposed to sanctify the Lord Jesus in our heart. Love God, have a relationship with Him, make Him, set Him apart, have our mind thinking the way that His mind is thinking, and that we are to be ready to give an answer for every man the, for the reason, that the, for the hope inside of us. So there's a hope inside of us that they're going to see. How do they see that hope? Well, they see it through relationship by us being friends. 
when you go up to somebody, a stranger on the street, and you begin to talk to them, and you find out that they're homosexual or, or anything like that, and you begin to just talk about that sin, what you're missing is an important fact, that they're more than that sin, that they're struggling with more than just homosexuality, as I am struggling with more than just lust in my mind about females. Man, I'm, I, I struggle with these things. These are things that I'm going through that the Lord's working out of me, that as I give myself to the Lord, God is delivering me and saving me from and giving me power. My, I don't just have one sin. I have plenty, a, a plethora of sins, and we all have plethoras of sins. When we isolate one sin, we're missing the point of what I talked about last week is that we have this indwelling sin, this sin nature that exemplifies itself on out, in, in outward actions. So the fact that I'm lusting after a woman or the fact that I, I cheat on a test or the fact that I, I steal something from the grocery store or the fact that I look at somebody with hatred in my heart is, well, it, it's, a, it's a sign. The fact that I get angry at somebody and yell at them is a sign of what's going on inwardly, of who we are. The homosexual is no different than you are. Love and relationship is an important thing. Romans chapter 2, 4. There's a part of Romans chapter 2, 4. It says this. What does it say? That repentance... This is why you're supposed to write them down when you're up here. All right, 2-4. says this. It's this. Or do you think lightly of the riches of the kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing, listen, not knowing that the kindness of God leads men to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads men to repentance. Yet we know about the wrath of God, and it's okay to talk about the wrath of God because that's the truth. But it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's that tenderness. It's that, hey, man, I love you. I know that, that, that you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, but let me be honest with you. I love you, I care about you, and I want, I'm, I'm your friend. Guys, it's not wrong to be like a homosexual's friend. And it's not wrong in here if you struggle with homosexuality and you come here. This is a place that's open for you. And what we hope is that you are transformed by the gospel. I hope that every one of you are transformed by the gospel and that God begins to work things out of you. Here's the a, here's a second thing that I want, or the third thing that I want to say. Incorporate secular arguments. All right. Incorporate secular arguments. What's a secular argument? Okay. In other words, don't just use the Bible. I haven't touched the Bible yet. Okay, I'm going to because I think God's word has a lot to say and I think God's word is the most important thing. Don't get me wrong in what I'm saying right now. But please incorporate secular arguments. Some of the people that you'll begin to talk to are not necessarily Christians. A lot of them will be atheists, not believing in God, whether they're homosexual or someone who's just a proponent of homosexuality. Okay? Listen, you have to be able to talk on their level and sometimes without the word of God in your hands. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't bring it in eventually, but incorporate it. Use the Bible and secular arguments. Um, study this issue by yourself. Like, don't just take what I'm saying right now, because I'm not saying much. I'm only giving you guys a little bit of points, and I'm hoping that you guys will begin to start thinking and looking these things up, and a lot of you guys have probably already thought about it. A lot of you guys have probably already formed your worldview on this, like what you think about it. Hopefully, I'm challenging your worldview, even if it's close to being right, um, that you're still rethinking about it, or maybe it's way off, um, that you're rethinking about it, that you're engaging your mind and, and thinking about these things, because this is dealing with people that you care about, and even maybe yourself. Study this issue, and try to put yourself in their shoes. I'm not saying go and, and, and do the acts or, or, or do what they do, but I'm saying just 
take the time and think about how you would feel in this situation. An effective strategy incorporates secular arguments. You can appeal to the natural law, like the things, the way things are made, like, yes, Adam and Eve, God made Adam and Eve. God made a helper for Adam. You see that naturally, man and woman go good together. They fit. Our sexual organs reproduce, and, and, and this is how we, we have families and, and, and make babies. This is the way that it works. This is the way that it's been created. That's, that's an important thing to know, that anything else is a perversion and doesn't work, and actually, in the end, is unhealthy. These things are not healthy. So that's like in a secular argument, like, this is for the well-being of individuals, why I believe what I believe. Not just because the Bible's saying it, but because I see that, that these behaviors are, are not beneficial for society or beneficial for, for people. Now, does that mean that I have a control of what you do in your house and things like that? Well, well no. But like legislation and stuff like that, I'm not going to get on that bunny trail, but guys, it's important that you, you talk about you know, the natural law, the, the common good, public health, things like that, that can make sense to people who aren't necessarily Christian, who don't have the Bible, who maybe never read the Bible. Um, using like a, apologetical arguments that I've talked about in the past, like that there is a God and that if there weren't a God, then there would be no right and wrong. Because, you know, who would you be to say what's right and wrong? I could go kill somebody. And who are you to say that it's right or wrong? I'm just working by my genetic code or like this is just how, this is just how I am. Who are you to say that it's right for you to walk a woman or an old woman across the street, you know? Without God, there's, there's, there's nothing moral to grasp. And, and coming back to, to that issue and, and talking about things is, is a good thing. You're, you haven't opened the Bible yet. Saying, and then going from, you know, since, since we have this feelings of right and wrong, this moral obligation that we see that it's wrong to kill, even if we don't have the Bible, everyone knows that it's wrong to kill. Everyone knows that it's wrong to do harm to your neighbor. Everyone knows this. So we see that there's a lawgiver, and he has other laws. And then you can go into the Word of God after you've set the groundwork. Here's the next point, and I only have two more. Okay, here it goes. Differenti or differentiate between orienta orientation and action. Differentiate orientation and action. This is important. You know, the question that I hear raised a lot is, man, I was born this way. Or what if they were born that way? Man, they can't control that. Why would God make them that way? Or, or I hear things like that. And maybe some of you guys have asked that question. And maybe you guys can ask that question again tonight to your small groups if you want further discussion about it. It's okay to talk about that stuff here. We, we don't mind. We welcome it. We want you guys to ask questions. We want to be challenged. We want to know the truth. We want to deal with things the way that we're supposed to. We like that. We encourage that, and we encourage you guys to think the same. So differentiate between orientation and action. I didn't ask, does the Bible forbid homosexuality? That's not, that's not the point. Does the Bible forbid homosexuality? That's not necessarily the point. The point is this, does the Bible forbid homosexual activity or behavior? This is an important distinction, guys. We're differentiating between orientation, whether or not you were created that way or not, and action, whether or not you're doing it. Is it wrong for a heterosexual, that means someone who likes the opposite sex, to engage in a homosexual act? Is it wrong? Yes. Is it wrong for a homosexual who likes the member of the same sex to engage in homosexual acts? The answer is yes. 
according to scripture. Now this has enormous implications. Like I said, that this separation. So you may have feelings for the opposite sex. Someone may have feelings for the opposite sex. But what they do with it is the important thing. It's just like if I think about over here, I'm a heterosexual man. Without God, guys, this is, this is fact, this is what I did. Without God, I was in school, I was walking around, checking out girls all the time. I was uh, being dirty in my mind according to what I saw. And whenever I would see the girls, I would go, mm, man, I want that. And I would think about it. I began to have my way with them in my mind. Okay? And that's wrong. Without God, n not wrong. I'm just doing what naturally, what comes natural to me. Man, this is a natural feeling that I have. Man, whenever I look at that girl, I just want her. And so I began to think about it in my mind. And I can talk about this freely, guys, because this is a safe zone. This is an area where we can be honest with one another. And also I know that a lot of you guys struggle with this. Okay? Whenever I, that's, that's, that was my natural inclination. That's what I was inclined to. To look at any beautiful woman and go, man, I want her. And to have my way with her in my head. But that was wrong. The inclination, even, even though that's a desire in my heart that I was maybe born with, that doesn't mean that I have the right to act on that desire and to begin to, to lust after that person. I have to look at what God's word, and when Jesus said, if you look at lust in your heart for a woman, it's the same thing as if you committed adultery with her. Whenever I saw that, I was like, oh man, what I've been doing this whole time is wrong. Yes, I can look at a woman, acknowledge her beauty, that's okay. I'm not saying that, you know, you have to be like, like not saying that, that, that women are beautiful or ignore the fact, you know, that, you know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I went the extra step and lusted. It, it was that, they call it the second look. You know, the first look is, oh. and the second look looks, oh. and then your mind goes, that's wrong. That first look is, okay, I noticed that. I know that there's sin, that I'm just a sinful man, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put on the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for my sin so that I could be free from it. So even though I'm inclined toward that, I'm not going to do it because Jesus Christ died for me. He rose from the dead to deliver me from sin, so I'm gonna lay that down and I'm gonna put on the Lord Jesus and I'm going to submit to God. That's something that we all have to do. That's not something that I'm just telling the homosexual to do. That's not something that God's just telling one person to do. That's everybody. We're all sinners. We all need him. So whether or not there's an inclination or not doesn't mean that something is right or wrong. Sometimes I have the inclination to just choke somebody. Does that mean I should go and choke them? No. That's wrong. So, the Bible does not condemn someone because he has homosexual orientation. Whether or not you think someone was born that way or not, there's debate on both sides of that issue. Still no scientific gene that shows that or anything like that. But even if there were, that's not, it doesn't matter. There's, that's not the point. The Bible doesn't condemn you for having sexual, homosexual orientation. That's why you're welcome here, anybody. That's why you can invite your friends here. What it condemns is homosexual acts. It's perfectly possible to be homosexual and to be born again. Whenever I'm, listen to me, I'm talking about orientation. If the way you're constituted is that, if that's what you feel and that's what you struggle with, it's, it's perfectly possible to be saved. Just like it's personally possible to be a murderer at heart and to be saved. God saved me, an adulterer at heart. 
what I'm inclined to is to lust after women and to have my way with whatever woman I want. But God saved me. God's working in my life. Is there still that temptation whenever I'm walking to double look? Yes. Do I sometimes go, and I'm like, oh, crap, I did it, man. I'm sorry, God. Yes. But it's a continual walking with the Lord, growing in the Lord. That's what it's about. That's what this Christian life's about. Here's the last thing I wanted to talk about. And then I'm going to give you guys application uh, just as kind of like a, just bringing this back around. What does the Bible say? So I talked about uh, a couple of things before this, but now we're going to just look at uh, a couple of things about what the Bible says. Uh, I think the best um, scripture verse to address this issue is Romans chapter 1. Uh, you can read all of Romans chapter 1. It's perfect. The reason I think it's perfect is because it doesn't just address one issue. It addresses many issues. So homosexuality isn't the only one that it mentions in here, but it mentions other. And it mentions the heart of the issue, that it's our hearts that stray away from God. That say, God, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to do what I, whatever I want to do. Let me read uh, just, a, just a couple verses of it. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. So God has been clearly seen by everybody, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. So it talks about their hearts being darkened. Yes, God, I know that you are, exist. I see creation. I see the moral law that, that you've given me. I know that you're a lawgiver. God, I see this all about you. But you know what? I like doing what I'm doing. I like sinning. God, I like looking at women. So bump that. I, you know what? I'm going to just, just erase that. And just whatever. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's the same sin that Adam and Eve committed. When they said, God, I don't care about your commandment. I'm my own God. They became futile in their mind. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image of formed corruptible man, of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They began to worship idols. So it talks about idol worship here. Therefore, God gave them over to their lusts of their hearts and impurities so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So they began to worship the sun. They began to worship nature. They began to worship energy. And forget about the God who created these things, who's above these things. They began to worship the things created who's blessed forever. Guys, don't think that we're above this, what the scriptures say here. You, when you see a fly car coming by, you're like, man, I want that car. You see that guy riding the car, you're like, ladies, you're like, man, I'd like him to give me a ride in that car. Guys were like, man, I wish I was him. All right? Naturally, that's what happens. When we see somebody with, with a lot of money, we're like, man, we're worshiping possessions. Yeah, we don't... We don't have a car like on top of our desk at home where we go, oh, Carl, I worship you. But that's really what we're doing. We're putting so much affection and love into these things. We're forgetting about the God who gave us imagination to create these things. For this reason, God gave them over to their degrading passions. Listen to this. This is clear. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which was unnatural. Here's scripture talking about the moral law, the natural law, the things that we see in nature. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to their depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Listen, 
this is what's good about this. It doesn't just talk about one sin. It talked about idolatry. It talked about here homosexuality. It, and now it talks about this, being filled with all unrighteousness, wicked, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. Listen to this one. You ready? This puts you on the same level. A lot of us are like, I mean, I'm not a luster. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not envious. I'm not a slanderer. I'm not a hater of God. Man, I don't hate God. I mean, I don't necessarily like him, but I'm not a hater of God. Listen to this next one. Disobedient to parents. God's like, I got you. All of you guys. All of you guys are on, on the, in the same category. And all of you guys are guilty of these other things in your heart. God's looking at your heart. Disobedience comes from the heart. Hatred comes from the heart. Envy comes from the heart. Who you are. What you're inclined to. They're without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God and that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give heartily approval for those who practice it. They say, well, good job. You're doing it too. Awesome. Man, I got somebody else who would do it with me. Man, if I'm going to hell, I'm going with all my friends. Woo, we're going to party. No, you're not. So, we see in Romans, and we see in other scripture verses, this is just my favorite. This is just the one that I think is appropriate, because you dodge the the bullet of just addressing one issue and you, you address many issues. Homosexual activity, um, you'll see this, that like liberal scholars, like people who are trying to reinterpret the Bible and make it say something else will have a filled day and they'll try to go through a lot of loopholes and they'll try to tell you what this verse is saying and what other verses are saying. There are like six areas in the Bible that mention homosexuality. And there's other places that mention it indirectly. There are other principles that are indirectly related. All right? It's hard to step around it. And they, they have a field day, man. They go around it and they'll say, well, this word in the Greek doesn't mean this. And the homosexuality that they're talking about in the Bible isn't the homosexuality, homosexuality that we experience today. But guys, listen to this. The homosexual activity was as widespread in ancient Greek and Roman societies as it is today in the U.S. And Paul stood up against it. Not the people. He loved the people. And he loved them enough to tell them the truth. Guys, this is not intolerance. This is love. This is love that says, I love you, I care about you. You need God. You need God because you're a luster at heart, just like me. You have hatred in your heart. All these inclinations, they're not glorifying to God, and God created us for something else. To honor Him. And God knows the best way, what's going to give you the most joy. And God's glorified when we're satisfied in Him, and when we lay down our rights before him, because then God can work and show us what real joy is. Joy isn't found in worshiping the sun. Joy isn't found in worshiping a car. Joy isn't found in worshiping money and worshiping fame. Joy is found in Jesus Christ, in God, the creator. Here's something, um, just one more thing about what the Bible says. Uh, a lot of people say that Jesus didn't mention anything about homosexuality. Uh, and therefore, since Jesus didn't mention it, it's okay that we do it. Uh, that's incorrect. Jesus, here's just two points. Jesus didn't mention homosexuality, but Jesus also didn't mention uh, incest and bestiality. He didn't mention a lot of things that, that we struggle with today. He didn't have to. However, I will say this, that Jesus did stand up 
for what Genesis 2.24 says. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and become one with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He upheld the natural woman and man relationship in marriage. Guys, outside of marriage, sex is wrong. Whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, sexual acts outside of marriage are wrong. That's for everybody in here. And that's what God's word says. And I tell you guys this all the time. You can either have, if I gave you two options up here, some of you guys might disagree with this, but oh well. If I gave you a Dr. Perky from Food Lion or a Dr. Pepper, most of you guys would choose this Dr. Pepper because it's the real thing. This is a cheap imitation of Dr. Pepper. Doesn't taste as good. Whenever you choose to go outside of marital context and have sex or engage in sexual activities, you're choosing this Dr. Perky. Whenever God says, I'm offering you Dr. Pepper, I'm offering you the real thing, the real deal, and I'll bless your marriage, and I'll bless that union with your wife. Man, you won't get tired of her. You're an enjoyer for the rest of your life. Now, because I said that, I also want to say this, that if you've messed up in that area, if you've went and had sex outside of marriage, it's not the end of the world. God can restore you. God wants to work in you. God's not through with you. Just like me, I was a sinner, messed up before I came to the Lord. Even whenever I've come to the Lord, I've made mistakes. But God is still loving and pursuing me. And God restores my soul. And God makes me whole. And I begin to enjoy life the way that God intended it. Is it easy? Nah, it's not easy. But it's worth it. All right. So this is the end. This is it. The application. How does this apply to you guys? All the information I just said. Guys, as I was, as I was looking at this, I'm like, man, I pretty much need... a more than just one little 30 minute period to talk about this. That's why I've went over time a little bit. But the application is this, and I hope that you guys talk about this, that you're loving. Guys, on both sides, I don't care what you believe, if I see you being dishonoring to another person because of what they believe, we're gonna have a talk. These are real people. You're a real person. We all deserve respect and honor. All right? Here's it. This, this is the first thing. To the homosexual, if there's any person in here struggling with homosexuality or you are a homosexual, this would be my encouragement to you. Number one, come to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sin. Notice I your sin, not just your act, but even who you are, who I am. Jesus Christ died for us. Number one, run to him. He knows how he created you. Number two is this. If you're a homosexual and you're a Christian and you struggle with this, my second thing is this. Keep yourself pure. I say the same thing to a heterosexual. Keep yourself pure. Resist the temptations. Is it hard? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. The scriptures say that God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. The scriptures say that no temptation has taken us, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. There's no temptation that's too big for you through the power of God. And here's the third thing. Talk to me. Seek help. 
if you're struggling with anything in here, come talk to me. Come talk to one of the leaders. That's what we're here for. If you're struggling with thoughts of suicide, if you're struggling with cutting yourself, if you're struggling with pornography, if you're struggling with anything, come and talk. You need each other. You need us. I need you guys. That's what God created this place for, is so that we can help one another, encourage one another. Say, hey man, I'm gonna be really honest. I struggle. I struggle with homosexuality, man. I, I struggle with having feelings for, for a woman. I like, I like guys. You know what I'm gonna say to you? I'm gonna say, man, let me, let me pray for you. Let me encourage you in that. Let's see what God can do. God's bigger than anything we're going through. You're struggling with thoughts of, of suicide. Come and talk to us. A lot of us understand that. You're struggling with anything. Come and talk to us. My door is always open. I'll give you my cell phone number. You can text me, call me, anything. Okay, here's the second thing. To the heterosexual and to even the Christian. Number one is this. There's three things that I want to tell you guys and then we're done. Treat homosexuals as you would anyone else. Make friends with people who are homosexual. Invite them here. Invite them over to dinner. I know a lot of us get scared, but let me say this. You can't catch their sin. It's not like, it's, it's not contagious. It's not like, yeah, like we get kind of like, I don't know if I should, I don't know, what would, I don't know, cool down, man. Just talk to them, be friends, share the love of Christ with them. And this one rolls into the second thing that I'm going to tell you. Don't make the gospel more difficult than it is. Don't make the gospel more difficult than it is. The gospel's this, that Jesus came to die for us who are sinners. Not just one sin, we've committed many. Point them to the love of Christ, that Jesus Christ died for them and he wants them, that he's pursuing them, that he's pursuing you. Don't make the gospel just about the homosexual issue, because it's more than that. By addressing the, the particular sin, you miss the point, and you lose the person oftentimes. Because you're like, well, this is what the Bible says, and they're like, man, I don't want to talk to that guy. All he ever does is shove the Bible in my face. We're to shove the Bible in their face, but not like that. But with our actions, with our love. It's okay to be really loving and being really like, hey, how are you doing, man? Man, you're awesome. Never even address the, the deal, the issue of homosexuality. And they're like, man, this guy just kind of bugs me a little bit. You know, he's just always loving. He's always, you know, being friendly to me. I'm just like, whatever. It, that's okay. You're, you're being loving and, and showing them what the gospel is. That you're not scared. That you don't judge them for this. Because you're constituted the same way. You're made up the same way with struggles. Number three is this. Aim to make a long-term difference, not a short-term statement. Make a long-term difference, not a short-term statement. Don't try to win arguments, and this takes time. It's not about arguments, it's about winning a person. Am I telling you to be shy about what the Word of God says? No, be clear what the Bible says. Do it in the right time, Look for opportunities to do it, but look for opportunities to show God's love for the sinner. Don't say cliches like I just said, Adam and Steve, or even things like no homo. Oh man, I'm calling no homo on that. I'm guilty of that. Be careful. 
you don't know what people are struggling with. This is an issue. This is something that is happening in our society. That's becoming more prevalent. Make statements in the form of questions. Questions are humble. Questions so show that you're not intimidated and that you want to hear what someone else is saying. And questions are smart. I mean, ask my question and you learn. Learn how to, to be tactful with your approach. Vulgar words and jokes. Listen, this last it. This is it. Vulgar words and jokes about homosexuals should never pass out of the lips of a Christian. 